Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, I have a lot to talk about today, so I will try to cut the chase, but um, uh, it's very good to be here in Dublin, okay, in Obas. Okay. Uh, I, uh, in my last, I come from, originally from security background for a long time, and, uh, um, yeah, uh, and... Uh, in the last few years, I've uh, turned to more to DevOps side of the world, okay, <laughs> it's Kubernetes, and it's really great to, side. yeah, the wrong side, and, and it's really good uh, to be here around you guys, so I, I really enjoyed this whole conference. So, we are going to talk about Kubernetes security, okay, and usually, you know, every cyber talk has this feeling that you're, everyone's getting, like, into the conference and into the room and like, wow, we are going to hear something great here and, and at the end you know you come out and say well the world is bad okay everyone wants, tries to attack us and like we're like, so i will try to avoid this okay this is much more of um i would say fy uh, um, and like talk okay so i want you to know okay what is uh, what is out there um we are going to talk a little bit about an overview a little bit about kubernetes security and um and we'll talk more about Kubernetes security posture. Okay. Um we are connected myself, one of the co creators of uh Cubescape, we are which we are about we are going to talk about a little bit more, uh, is a Kubernetes security posture uh tool. Uh and my company Armo is also in that sec in that space. So we are going to take this direction and mostly we'll talk about the things we are seeing there out in the wild. Um so again, a little bit recap about myself. Um, CTO, co-founder, maintainer. Uh, I used to attack a lot of systems for a very long time and got fed up by it. Uh, and I decided I want to build something and not just to break. So I've moved to the development side of the security. Uh, and uh, uh, ever since I've stayed there, uh, I'm contributor in, in CNCF and Cloud Native uh, uh, um, Computing Foundation. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this is my, my GitHub, my, uh, Twitter. So if you want to join me, okay, you'll be more than welcome. So, Kubernetes, what is Kubernetes? I, actually, I'm really happy to see that so many people came here. Okay. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't expecting uh, to see so much, uh, so many faces here. So how many of you are using Kubernetes? Wow. Okay. Awesome. So there is no, 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 no <laughs> I don't need to talk about it too much, but uh, Kubernetes is becoming the de facto, uh, I would say, uh, the common standard of, wor of running workloads in, uh, uh, in the cloud. Um, if, I, if we are trying to recap a little bit, okay, why, just, uh, why Kubernetes came alive? Um, and I'm going to say here something very opinionated, okay, and not something uh, that I think that the reason why, that because Google felt that he, want, he will lose to AWS and therefore try to create this uh, uh, porting layer above uh, uh, the workload API just to enable people to move to Google at a later stage. So, but in general, okay, it's really uh, this uh, uh, system has really become, I think, for many, the favorite system, okay, to, to run workloads. And I can understand why. So, um, the, the problem which came with Kubernetes is actually a little bit, uh, from a security perspective, is that um, although okay, the cloud security just started to ramp up, okay, in, in the like 10 plus years ago, um, but Kubernetes just created this like white spot, okay, for uh, for the security experts because they needed they just, they just started to learn a little bit about cloud about containers now there's a new whole ecosystem okay they have to learn and and sometimes sometimes it's this stuff okay it's tough to keep up because, because all, all of us who are security practitioners we all know that the security uh, practitioner needs to know all the details right so without knowing the details you cannot understand how to make uh, sense of your security so uh, you know, when we are thinking of, of of Kubernetes, there is multiple reasons, okay, why people are using Kubernetes, and we we did a survey with our with our customers, um, 
And I think that you can see that for the most, we have asked them why they think, okay, that it is important, they are using Kubernetes. And they answered, okay, that those very, very nice things like improved scalability, uh, shorter deployment time, imp- improved availability. I don't know if you noticed, but their security is not among them. Okay. Uh, and, and, and this list, uh, just, you know, just on top of my mind. Uh, uh, so, and obviously there are other like things which I think that that doesn't, doesn't, Kubernetes did not bring them to us. Okay. Like short release cycles, but, but I think they are just like implemented the way, uh, the people expected them to implement, uh, uh, deployments and, uh, and new practices. Now, anyone who have heard of, of Chris Romeo, uh, or this morning's, uh, 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 keynote speech, okay, knows that Netflix is releasing like 10 times every minute, okay, and we are not Netflix. Having said that, okay, still it is hard, okay, it's, it's hard to keep up, okay, with all these releases, even with, in a smaller company for a security practitioner. So, uh, why, the, this leads us, why do we need, uh, uh, Kubernetes security? Okay, and there is a very interesting, okay, notion here. Uh, many people think that when we are migrating to, cl- to the cloud, okay, the cloud takes care of our security. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no comment. Okay. Uh, but there is a very, very important part of it. Okay. Since all our infrastructure is actually defined as a code, we have what is called as a configuration. Okay. We have to take very pre- uh, big precautions in order uh, to make sure that this configuration is secure, okay? And we are defining secure objects because this configuration is going to be turned into our infrastructure, right? And this is why Gartner mentioned that, that, uh, um, that as they looking at uh, it, that, okay, most of the cloud breaches will come from, from, uh, from misco- uh, misconfigurations, okay? They mentioned this uh, 99% of, of uh, security breaches are coming from uh, misconfigurations. Now again, let's take it. Okay, it's Gartner. Okay, let's take it into uh, uh, like know that what they are talking about. That, but if we are defining everything as as, as misconfiguration, right? Everything is going to be a misconfiguration problem. But it's still an interesting notion. Okay, and and if we are going further, okay, into rabbit hole. Okay, we know that we can see a Kubernetes from two security directions. Okay, one is the posture, how we have defined, okay, the Kubernetes cluster, how the workloads are defined, how we have delivered our secrets into the cluster, uh, all the things around, okay, how we have defined uh, 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 our access criteria, okay, for the users and so on. Um, and we can uh, talk about runtime security. So obviously, okay, I think that most of this uh, uh, um, conference is talking about runtime security, and I'm not, okay? What I'm going to talk about for, uh, with you more is about more of the posture and definitions and how people are using Kubernetes. And I think that the, one of the interesting things is, and, and I always heard uh, in during these two days, I heard this notion of, of discussing, okay, whether shift left, shift right, shift whatever, wherever. Okay. I still think that, that, and I think that there is a general agreement around here that the thing which, and uh, which, uh, infrastructure as a code enables us. Okay is to test things ahead of time, even before deployment. And, and I don't think that anyone questions that this is the right thing to do. I, maybe it's not enough, but it's, uh, it, it must be done uh, even before other things. So this brings me to the project, open source project we started, um, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, it, and I have to insert here a very short and private uh, story. Okay, um, NSA... Um, came out with its uh, uh, um, recommendations about how to configure a Kubernetes cluster and manage it uh, securely. Now, we said, well, let's make a tool of it. Let's make a tool which scans your cluster and tells whether it stands in the, in the hardening rules of, of NSA and like paragraph, paragraph going through it and, and, and creating an output for it. And like we went through, a, invested in it, I think, a week or week and a half with my friend, David, and and came out released the tool. Okay, maybe I've sent a Twitter message about it. I th- I don't know where we've uh, published it, but it w- we released it in GitHub. 
Now, uh, we went home. It was, I think it was a Friday, went to sleep, weekend. And I think on Monday, my friend uh, from the U.S. calls me and says, well, you are awesome. Your tool is great. I said, I'm happy to hear. Uh, do you know how many stars do you have on GitHub? I said, I don't know, two, three, four. I said, man, you have 500 within like literally two, three days. And you can see that uh, that Cubescape had this high steep of, uh, of traction on GitHub. And, and it was a tool we released in order to enable users to, to, uh, uh, to scan their clusters for security misconfigurations, according to NSA. And uh, uh, it, it became uh, a really, really big hit. Now, what it enables you is... Um, it enables you to tell you what's wrong in your clusters, but in the same time, it was very important for us, even when we wrote the first line of code, okay, not just to scan the cluster through Cube API and scan the Kubernetes object and tell uh, what is wrong in them in security-wise or co uh, compliance-wise, but also to be able to scan your YAML files, your uh, 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 your Helm chart, uh, and your customized uh, uh, files. This enables you to to like build this whole process of, of of working from like the developer side to the actual application deployment side and like you can in you we have our visual studio code extension so when when while you're writing okay uh, the kubernetes yaml files you already get a, a feedback uh, about them and just you know like a month and a half ago we were accepted cubescape was accepted to cncf and become a cncf project yeah uh, uh, which is, I think it's, it's, uh, extraordinary. Okay. In the sense that, that I think that I, there are a lot, I don't think there are a lot of projects which are, uh, you know, start CNCF journey when they already have like seven K stars. So, uh, we are aiming, uh, incubation this year, but we'll talk a little bit uh, more later. So what, I, what is also important for us is giving you a general security posture. So going from the configuration sc scanning site, we went to scanning for application vulnerabilities inside the Kubernetes cluster because many people said that it was very, very important for them. Uh, and we, we agree in general, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, and it was really important for us, okay, not just to give you, uh, like, here is the, all the, all our findings, like, do it yourself, okay? Uh, uh, break your bones, okay, and, and try to solve it. But we, we tried to do it in a way that you can get, uh, uh, solvable issues, issues that the, uh, you can implement very fastly. We are giving you uh, rem automatic remediation proposals, okay, to, to all these issues uh, we are finding and to prioritize them properly. So we are saying, okay, that whether an issue is really, uh, really looks like a high severity issue or it, uh, it looks like something that you can live with for, uh, for a while. Now, how it is connected to my company is uh, Armo, is, uh, Armo has a platform. Uh, which actually, you know, receive the data for uh, from this tool and, and enables you to, uh, in its SaaS uh, uh, environment, it enables you to uh, uh, to overview your whole all the clusters you are having, all your registries, repositories uh, you are having, and see all the issues in everywhere, and, and you know, gives you an overview and a time-based view over that. But why why we are coming to this? Okay, because there are we have a huge number of of users. Also open source and also uh, uh, also the Arma platform says, and uh, you can see all these uh, uh, all these names, all these companies. Okay, you can see all these uh, users, and I have to tell you, okay, that that beyond obviously, okay, that there is a, a business venture behind, okay, uh, the Armo itself. You know, for us, for open source developers, uh, it is really really great to get you know all this feedback, okay, from everyone and and all the love, which is a big thing uh, for us, but. What's more interesting that today we have, I think, more than 400 active uh, customer accounts. And I don't want to go into this, what we call an active account. We have way more inactive accounts, but uh, but we have 400 customers who are like uh, actively using the UI every day and more than 1,000 who are sending data uh, to our, uh, to our uh, SaaS. All right? So we've got a lot of data. So what do we do today with a lot of data? We're starting to play with it, okay? That's a great thing, okay, to uh, to play with the data. So what kind of data do we have? And this is, like, going to be more or less the structure of the uh, rest of the talk. Um, 
we are having this layer of configuration of Kubernetes clusters, which we are going to talk about, uh, how they are configured. We are sending uh, Kubescape scans the cluster uh, API, uh, the host, okay, it scans uh, a little bit the, um, the cloud API and sends all its findings to the Armor platform. Or, by the way, it can also, you know, you can also use it locally without the Armor platform. But uh, uh, in general, okay, we have this information for our, uh, our users for a given time. Uh, and we also have vulnerability information. We are scanning all the images from our users' uh, 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 cluster, from their uh, from the repositories they've set up. So we have all these image scans uh, uh, in our in our backend. In I don't know if I can. I'm, let's say so. I, we have an Elasticsearch uh, cluster, okay, storing all these uh, scan data. So we have an easy way, okay, to to uh, uh, to query them. So. Just to give a, a, you a little feeling a, 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 about the data set we are working with, uh, which I'm going to show you. So we have close to 17,000 uh, uh, cl different clusters in our, in our data set. It, we are, we have seen more than 40 million Kubernetes objects, uh, which are ranging from like uh, Kubernetes deployments to our, uh, our objects and so on, config maps. Uh, we have seen uh, 178 uh, container registries. Uh, we have uh, with, with like nearly uh, 50,000 uh, container images and image scans. Uh, and we have seen nearly 2,000 uh, GitHub repositories, uh, which uh, which contains um, Helm charts and YAML files. Okay, which are meant to deliver to to Kubernetes clusters. So we have this whole bunch of data. And the first step what we are going to look at is actually the, the configuration scans. So we're going to look at the Kubernetes objects out of the two things which I told you. And we are going to compare um, these, uh, the numbers, the interesting numbers we found, uh, the statistics we made to the general sample, to whole, the whole population, to, uh, to what we are seeing in uh, CNCF graduated projects. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what is it. So we are going to look at the distribution of the controls, uh, uh, which failed and which we've been uh, issues, which been uh, reported. And, you know, we'll try to make sense of, of, of the control failure ratio and understand a little bit of, of, of the hard things. Okay. We are, we are, we are seeing. So just a little bit about, again, about the data. We tried to like create, make sense of a little bit of the data and compare open source projects, uh, to like the whole population. It is really hard. Okay. For, uh, for a data set to say what is a, a open source project and what is not. Um, and, and we decided to go with uh, the graduated project of CNCF. Uh, there is a project, uh, uh, life cycle in CNCF, which starts by sandboxing. Okay. Every entry level project starts there, just like us. They are going to incubation. The incubation already requires you to do, uh, to um, to work in a very specific way uh, uh, with your open source. You have to have maintainers for multiple uh, uh, companies. Uh, uh, you must have a uh, uh, decision making process, some or, or the early quality requirements uh, uh, before going uh, into what they call the chasm, uh, where is you know most of the projects fail. Okay, because there is an early adoption, okay, around projects, but they are not really able to like go through that. And, but those who are able to, and there are big adoption around that, uh, are going into what they call graduation, which are already requires a lot of, uh, uh, uh quality, uh, uh, requirements among them security. So there is a, a whole big security process around this open source project, how they are managed, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, the reason why I've chosen these graduated projects because I wanted to a little bit see whether the graduated projects are a little bit better from a security perspective than the general sample. And uh, like I know I'm killing the punchline. Uh, yes, they are a little bit better. Uh, uh, so um, so the way we are going to look at the things is a little bit way we are selves representing the information. So in the Cubescape world, there are things which we call controls controls a little bit. Uh, it's like a, a single test of a single property of an object. Uh, frameworks, which are frameworks 
which are containing different controls and think about it as compliance frameworks. So you have like, if control is a requirement, then a framework is a, uh, is a group of, or a bunch of, of multiple requirements, like think about SOC 2 or I don't know, uh, something uh, uh, like. Uh, and we have a lot of them. So if I'm returning to, to the notion of controls, it controls in uh, Cubescape is really, again, is something, a single test, okay, we're running. So think about it. We're trying to very focus it on, on a single property. Usually there are multiple properties when in complex, more complex controls, uh, contextual information, which is important, but, uh, think about it as, uh, in these examples, you can see that you have like, Controls for test, uh, detecting privileged containers. Uh, 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 whether your serv Kubernetes service account is mounted into the container, whether a container is open to ex uh, uh, to external traffic from the public internet, whether the workload has a critical vulnerability, and so on. And we are going to talk, you know, around uh, these things. So the reason we start wanted to create statistics around our frameworks, and as of today. Uh, we are supporting even more uh, uh, frameworks, uh, but when I created, uh, started work with this data, we only supported four. So we have this, the original NSA CISA framework with its own requirements, the MITRE framework uh, by Microsoft. Microsoft created this great paper on how to secure uh, 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 Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have our own suggestion uh, uh, framework, and there is a DevOps framework for best practices for the uh, DevOps people. And the reason why we are not going into this, because I haven't found it really interesting, is it turned out that most of the uh, uh, the failures around these frameworks were really correlated to each other. And and I thought that it, it wouldn't be interesting. So therefore, there is no real reason to discuss this. But um, if we are looking at uh, a, a, specific, a specific scan, okay, we are doing and we are scanning all of our, I know today we have more than, 150 controls, uh, uh, most of the, the, during the time where we created this sample, we had around 100. Um, so, uh, we, we try to check for per, uh, per every cluster we are scanning. Okay. How many, uh, of the controls, uh, are failing? Okay. Out of all the controls, uh, trying to, you know, get an initial in, uh, information. And as you can see that there is an interesting distribution here, okay, because like you can see that the 14 controls have failed in, in most cases. What does it mean is that there are 14 very common security issues, which are most of the clusters have in common. And, and the distribution gave us the idea, okay, to go a little bit deeper and try to find out, okay, what these controls are and what are the security issues which we see in this general population. Um, so when we looked at the general population, we started to look at how, uh, what are the most failing uh, controls. And I just showing here, uh, 10, but uh, out of the 14. Um, so if I'm going to, I will, be, uh, we'll go into it a little bit deeper, but the first control you can see on the left is what we call uh, 17 immutable root file system. Uh, it's a control to check whether the container has an immutable file system configured. Obviously, if the uh, if the container file system is mutable, the attacker has like write uh, can write things on, on on the file system very easily. So in general, it's a good idea, okay, to to turn it off if not needed. Uh, actually, I have to tell you that it's really hard to configure it properly, okay, because most containers do write, okay, inside things. So you have to like go into each uh, uh, folder, okay, where they are, which they are using for writing and like define it as a, as an external amount, which is, which is a big hassle. Um, their resource limits are returning as, a, as a control, which are failing in many, many places, in many, many directions. So, uh, those of, I hope that most of you have dealt with Kubernetes before. Okay. You know that that limiting your containers is not just a good thing from security perspective, but it's also a really good thing from a, from a, a general uh, operational perspective. Okay, you can calculate how much CPU and memory your application is going to use and limit it. Uh, um, but from a security perspective, it's it's really clear. Okay, that that uh, any kind of denial of service attack uh, uh, attack 
can be more effective in a place where where the containers have unbound memory and uh, and CPU usage. Um, Non-root containers, we'll go talk about it a little uh, more. Okay, container is running as root container, and it's a bad thing. Uh, allowing privilege escalations inside the container, so uh, SUIDs uh, 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 can be used. Uh, memory again limits uh, uh, limits uh, label usage, which is not, I don't say it's not a security issue; it's more a DevOps issue. And security uh, applying security context and second uh, profiles. And the last one is automatic mapping of ser uh, uh, service account. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Just and just now to compare a little bit about the graduated projects. So the interesting thing was here that I expected much less uh, 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 issues around that, but they turn out that they are not really. There is no not a big difference among the two kind of. They they're a little bit better than the general population. Uh, mostly, as you can see, that the, again the limits is an issue in general. Uh, an immutable file system and non-root containers and so and other things are a little bit pushed back, so they are less prevalent. But let's just going into a little bit deeper into the controls. So non-root containers. Uh, anyone here who can explain me what can a root do or uh, inside a container? And what is different in having a root inside the container and outside the container? Take over the host. It's it's not directly can take over the host because it's confined by the container. Okay, so it, it has its own C group and namespace and sees only like part of the of the host file system. Still, it has the user ID of zero, right? Anyone? Why it is important not to have root containers? Yeah. Hmm? No, cannot. You cannot. You only it, it, you, you need you need so. Every, by default, the container runtime will remove you the capability to to do all these good things like loading kernel modules and and stuff like that. So, the, so let, okay, good, good point, good point. Okay, we are not talking about capabilities, but let's say that that it, this doesn't have any capabilities. So the reason why it is a, it is a very bad idea, okay, because most of the kernel exploits, okay, we are which are. Uh, uh, which are very, which are working around, you know, containers to escape a container confinement is, uh, they are working mostly with when the user ID is zero. So think about it. Okay. If the kernel, despite that your processes inside the container are very confined, they are removed for all the, all their capabilities, uh, still inside the, uh, the kernel structures, your user ID is zero and it enables you different code paths, better code paths for the attacker than if it would be a non-root container. So in general, uh, people would say, well, this uh, uh, root inside the container is not a root outside the container, and it's completely true. Having said that still, if you want to make sure that, not sure, but if you want to make uh, the life of the attacker very hard, you have to remove, uh, uh, reconfigure your containers to run as as non-root. So in the general sample, 91% of, of the containers are running as root, and inside the graduated sample, 84. Let's go on. Immutable file system, I've talked to you a little bit about before. So it's a test checking, okay, whether your file system <laughs> inside the container is uh, is writable. Uh, um, and and mostly I don't see a big difference here between the two samples. Okay, the general sample is 97%. Most, very, uh, most containers today are configured without this protection. And I know, as I told you before, I know why, because it's a little bit hard uh, to configure it. Uh, but the graduated projects have a little bit more, which are configured with this. So automatic, disable automatic mapping of service account tokens. Service account tokens? Anyone know what is it in Kubernetes? Anyone? So service account is uh, is a subject in the Kubernetes uh, authorization system, which is given to uh, to software and not users and groups. Uh, uh, service accounts are uh, uh, can be used to access Kubernetes API. And as of Kubernetes today, designed every Kubernetes container gets the default service account of its namespace. And it means that it automatically has some access to the Cube API. At, at least it can get authenticated. It may not be authorized to do things, but it can be authenticated. Now, I can tell you that 
move the most containers which are running inside, inside Kubernetes, and I don't have a specific number for it, but most containers who are not infrastructure containers, but application containers, doesn't use service account token. So there is no real need to give containers access to the Kube API. So when if an attacker uh, is able to uh, uh, penetrate your container and get execution over your container, it will find a token which it, uh, on the file system which can use to talk to the Kube API, and it's it's a bad thing. So uh, in the general sample, most of the workloads uh, are configured to 81% are automatically mounting service account tokens and 69 in the uh, in the graduated sample. Uh, applying security contacts. So se a security contact in Kubernetes is a configuration for containers and pods, which enables you to limit your container behavior uh, um, in different ways. You can de define SC Linux profiles to be as associated with. You can define a second profile. All of them are, are not easy to configure, but very, very good for security. Uh, and, uh, and also you can, here's the security contacts are a way to change the user ID of your container and, and so on. Um, and it's important, okay, to, to at least define it in a basic way. So as I told you before, defining it as non-root container, uh, trying to, uh, take out of privileges from, uh, from container, which are not, not required. Um, and, you know, as I see today, uh, there is a big difference, okay, again, between the graduated projects and general sample. 77% uh, for the general sample is actually was a, a, a surprise for me. I thought it would be much less uh, because usually people are not not uh, uh, investing a lot of time into uh, uh, into security contacts, but, uh, uh, but it's still something to start with. Um, and as a lot of, uh, of these numbers, I think the interesting thing is that um, I I try to calculate here uh, how what's the percent of controls failing in each, each sample and each workload. So in each Kubernetes workload, try to see um, what's the percent of the controls is failing uh, in general in this sample in every workload, and there is a slight difference, okay, uh, between between the two samples. I wouldn't call it very like something that uh, that we can learn a lot about uh, from it, but it, I can see that there is slightly better okay in the open source graduated projects. So um, getting back to okay to the general numbers, uh, because I, I thought it would be interesting okay just to look, again as an overview of the Kubernetes uh, 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 solution space, um, they, we can see that. There is in the container security, if we are, you are looking at uh, above, okay, 75% of the containers which we are seeing, okay, have at least one high or critical vulnerabilities, okay, which is a lot. Um, we can, uh, uh, um, you know, we can see a lot of people are attaching shells into their containers as their, their daily work, which is, I think it's, it's not a good sign in anyhow, anyhow. Uh, and as I told you, okay, a lot of containers running as root, and here it is the general sample has been combined with the with the graduated sample. So in our um, in our sample, okay, we've seen uh, uh, you know uh, customer accounts where we've seen uh, one half of them are using only single cluster, or or a little bit more in two and three uh, five clusters. Uh, we can see a few, okay, with uh, uh, customers with a lot of, uh, um, with bigger uh, number of clusters. And inside the uh, uh, the number of nodes uh, inside uh, the cluster, you can see that uh, most of the clusters we've seen in the sample have uh, less than five nodes. Uh, then are there are medium clusters to are from six to, I would say, uh, uh, like 15 uh, uh, nodes, which is also not so big, uh, and eight and up are, are, are less in the sample. Uh, we can also see that there is, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, OS vulnerabilities around. Okay. We are also scanning the operating system behind the Kubernetes node. Uh, uh, and we can see that there is a big prevalence. Okay. Also here relatively too high to critical, 
uh, vulnerabilities. These uh, these are not image scans. These are these are uh, VM scans. Um, and I think that that the other interesting thing is that when we've asked users, okay, where uh, and and combine it with our statistics, where they are scanning their container images, uh, most of them only scanned them in runtime. Uh, and a lot of them in CI/CD pipelines, which I, for me actually it makes a lot of sense. Okay, because you want to prevent vulnerable images getting into your cluster uh, before uh, uh, before they are actually being started to use. And there are a few who are scanning their whole registries already. So just a little bit again, uh, some numbers. Um, Kubernetes is built on on container runtimes. Most of the, you know. Kubernetes clusters today still use Docker as uh, as their uh, uh, Docker uh, container runtime, but we see a lot of uh, container Ds as well and a few cryo uh, uh, implementations. Um, there are um, there are a lot of um, lot of alerts. Okay, we've so started to detect around uh, uh, around Kubernetes clusters. They are not really uh, um, I would say security related. Uh, uh, alert. So therefore, I, I'm I won't go inside. If you want to look, you will know, see it a little bit more. Okay, I will post in sketch the 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 whole uh, all the slides. Um, so you'll be able to, if you're interested, you will be able to go it into a little bit more. So now we're going to uh, the container image scans. Uh, now I know that we are in an AppSec conference. And some of the things will be really, uh, you know, clear for you, but a lot of Kubernetes practitioners were like really surprised by, by a few things. And, and I tried to adopt, uh, 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 to them, uh, explain them, okay, what is the, their relation to these vulnerabilities, which we are seeing in, in their clusters. So we are going to, again, going into two, going to, uh, uh, compare a few, uh, properties of, of the two samples we've been, uh, uh working with. Uh, we're going to look uh, how the distribution of severities of these issues are coming up. And I think the main thing is going to be reviewing the top CVs in both, uh, uh, in both, uh, population and go talk a little bit about their relevancy. So, uh, images, uh, image repositories, okay, with the most cans in the general sample, uh, you can see a lot of, uh, Argo CD, uh, uh, Redis, uh, again, Argo Prometheus, uh, MongoDB, uh, Datadog agents, um, uh, already within this table, you can already see a lot of, uh, uh, open source graduated projects. Um, uh, if we're going to the graduated sample, you can again see Argo CD, uh, Prometheus, uh, uh, and Kubernetes components themselves. Okay. We've seen a lot of, uh, a, a lot of these images. Now, if I'm, Comparing, okay, their, their, the distribution of the vulnerabilities of the issues we are finding, uh, we can see a little bit, little difference, okay? Because if I'm looking at the distribution, again, of, of the severity, I can see that, that, um, that there are from, and I'm going from, you know, critical to high, there are a little bit more critical issues in the, in the graduated sample, but much more uh, uh, high severity issues in the, uh, general, uh, general sample. And a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh issues around, uh, around, ne which are negligible in, also in the general sample and a lot of medium issues in the graduated sample. So I've tried to make a little bit sense of it. Couldn't really, you know, uh, put my hands on, on what is, what can be interesting. So I started to look at what are the, the top vulnerabilities in the general population. I'm sorry for this, uh, that this table is cut, but by far in the general population, I saw the first CV you see in, uh, in the first line, uh, 22, 28, uh, 391 is, was mo mo one of the most prevalent, okay, by far, uh, in all of our scans. In the, in the general sample, we have seen, uh, like 36,000 ish, uh, 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 image scans. Okay. With, with this issue. Uh, then after it, it's a busy box issue. We'll talk more about it. Um, there is like, uh, after it, the numbers are really getting back to like 
close to each other. Okay, we you have a few uh, a few several uh, issues which are which are on fourteen uh, hundred uh, and so on. And bef- after it, it goes a little bit uh, down. Now I've just looked on high and critical severity issues uh, for the sake of this discussion. I didn't thought it would be interesting to talk about issues which are like medium and below. Um, and there is good reason for it, and we'll talk a little bit uh, later. So, the first issue, okay, which was the, by far the most common, uh, is a is a busy box issue. Now, um, why do we have busy box inside the container? I would love to hear if someone. It is small, but why do you? You're right. You need these tools, but why do you need these tools? I'm writing, a, I don't know, a Java application. Why do I need BusyBox in the container? Yeah? Maybe for debugging. Do we like debuggers, by the way, in security cons? No, 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 not really. Uh, so, so the reason why you have uh, 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 BusyBox inside, because right, BusyBox is the, I would say, the Swiss army knife, right, of the shell. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it cons- it's small and it contains a lot of tools we are using. Uh, and um, as you can see in this case, it also contains netstat com- uh, compiled inside. Um, but in order to answer, okay, the, my you know my own question, the reason why it is there because the way we are building containers, okay, op- uh, opening directories, doing all this stuff is is the way that we have to add these tools inside the container. So the way Docker defined first, like 10 plus years ago, uh, uh, the way we are building containers layer after layer, okay, each in order to execute a command inside the container to build the next layer, you need to have these tools inside. So if you want to do an mkdir command inside the building process in your container, you must have an M- uh, mkdir executable, which is visible, gives you it. So, uh, so BusyBox is coming for, uh, with a built-in uh, netstat, uh, where if you are parsing your DNS uh, uh, um, DNS record with netstat, uh, you're uh, you're prone to a takeover by a malicious record. So I don't know if any one of you have anyone par- used netstat to parse uh, DNS records. I've never. I never. I even don't know that it is possible. But it is possible. But it not just can take over your terminal; it can also change the colors of your terminal. So it's a. I, I think I, I. I can't resist. I, I love this the, the CV definition here, because yeah, uh, um, colors are important. Now, um, so I, I've tried to think. Okay, how relevant? Okay, in cloud native environment, if you're running inside the Kubernetes, can this be exploited? And honestly, I. Uh, the answer is no. I, I don't really think that this is uh, like two minutes. And that? I thought I have an hour. Oh, okay. 15 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to be very fast from now again. Bear with me. So it's not relevant. Let's go on. Okay, libcrypt. Uh, uh, again, an issue okay, of, of side channel attack on libcrypt. Okay, vulnerability which was there. Why is it, why is it inside the container? Uh, it is inside the container to validate in packages. Okay, we are downloading with your package manager. Now, again, in order to validate packages, uh, you know, we know that we are using public keys, so there are only public keys inside the container. A side channel attack on a public key is not really interesting, right, guys? So, uh, this is not an interesting attack again. Uh, SQLite, uh, uh, he based attack, uh, which is actually, I have to tell you that, that, uh, uh, it is, it is actually a very nice attack. I, I read a, little, a lot about this, but again, you have to have SQBA as an attacker. You have to be able to uh, inject an SQL query to able to take over. So even before you've taken over the container, you already have SQL injection. So just saying. Uh, um, so as it turns out, as I've went through all of these, uh, I've, I've seen, okay, that there are only two which I can say that are close of the top 10, which I could say in some very rare cases that can be exploited. So I would say, well, honestly, this image scanning thing is not really good. Uh, uh, so when I went to graduated projects, and, and uh, again, because we don't, I thought that we have more time, uh, but uh, uh, I will go through it very fast. Okay, uh, 
the first issue, okay, it turned out that, uh, which was the most prevalent, it turns out that it, it is a, a bug in the scanner itself. It misidentifies a, a, a package and a Go package to a C package, and it, 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 it put this, whatever it is actually on the C package, and nothing, nothing Go, so it's not a real issue. And it turns out, okay, that out of the uh, uh, graduated sample, okay, there were five, which I would say, exploitable issues. If I'm looking, okay, at this, uh, the, uh, the distribution of issues, you can see a huge difference, okay, between the graduated sample and the general sample. Graduated projects has way more, uh, sorry, way less vulnerabilities in them than, uh, uh, than, you know, general, uh, in the general sample or any kind of other project. And I start to say, well, okay. CNCF is awesome. Okay. We are very, very happy. Okay. And let's, but then, you know, the engineer inside me kicked in and said, well, let's start to ask questions. Okay. Because the, it is clear for all of us. Okay. That, that image vulnerabilities, uh, found by the scanner is not the same. That's something that you can exploit. Okay. Uh, actually it's very far from it. And we have in Cubescape, we have a, a, a tool which is called sniffer. Okay, which uses eBPF. It's a POC project. It's not for, uh, uh not for production, uh, uh, but for our own research. Um, but we are building a, a great feature of it that we are actually scan, uh, looking at the workload behavior during the runtime of the container, seeing what, which, uh, software packages are all opened inside the container using eBPF and, uh, feeding it back to the scanner. So we are discarding all the, all the packages from the uh, vulnerability scan, which are not running inside the container. And uh, uh, it is great, okay, because as it turned out, uh, you know, and I'm coming back here. Okay, so you have this en Nginx coming out with 400 vulnerabilities, and only four of them are actually running inside the container. So it's really fun, okay, to, to see that how bad the image scanners are. I mean, not that bad. They are doing what they are doing, but, but uh, they are not really useful. Uh, for our security people. So, um, I've tested again, okay, uh, uh, a lot of the images which been, uh, which been in our general sample and used only the relevant vulnerabilities. Uh, and this is the corrected, uh, 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 results. So you still see a big difference, okay, in the number of, of, of vulnerabilities in between the general sample and the graduated project, but you can see the difference is not one to 10, right? So it's, <laughs> it's something that is uh, ma making more, a little bit more sense to us. Uh, so we, we can see that actually it's much better. The, the question arises, okay, that why, why, I don't know if you noticed, okay, but the numbers of the graduated sample haven't nearly changed here. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, now, the reason for that is that most of the uh, CNCF projects are written in Go, right? And Go as a single binary loaded into memory. So we didn't really have a way to detect, uh, define which are unused code paths and so on. So it's, it, it, it's less interesting. So, uh, closing thoughts. Um, in the uh, vulnerabilities, there was, uh, I think that there is, a, uh, it, obviously we could show that there are Less vulnerabilities around CNCF graduated projects, but I can't say for sure that they are better from a security perspective for 100% because, because I don't have them, I haven't checked, okay, which can be actually exploited in which scenario. So, but there is a good hunch that they are better. Um, and in the misconfigurations, okay, we've seen that there, uh, that the general population and the, the open source population are really close. There is slight you know, they're slightly better maybe, you know, in the graduated projects, but there are, there are no real, you know, difference. And I think that there is a lot to do around, okay, securing uh, the configurations about Kubernetes clusters because both of them, are, in my point of view, most of them are really bad, okay, and they are really have to improve. So, questions? Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at um, all of those things that uh, on the configuration side, um, if, if, if Kubernetes clusters are running as a managed service on AWS or Azure or GCP, are there, would you find that there's certain configurations which are just sort of inherent in the way the cloud environment is 
So, very good question, uh, and good that you asked it because I should have explained it that uh, we have tests which are like in this sample which we used. I've eliminated all the uh, all the controls which are going from KubeAPI and below. So all the things which are related to the Kubernetes infrastructure, okay, which are very very different in the case of the, who is managing the cluster, whether you are doing it on your premises or whether AWS or EKS. I didn't want to put in because I felt that they are not really meaningful. I need to work a way around, okay, how to make them interesting. Um, but I have to tell you that in the case of the controls we've seen, they are the very same from each. These are like from the cluster API and north of it. Okay, all everything like things we are checking, like whether your Cube API uh, server has been set up securely. Okay, we have controls around that. I cannot test this for AWS. And honestly, I think they are doing a good job. So uh, there's a, not no real point, okay, of like comparing, you know, AWS to like on-prem. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can, yeah, I can show you. In the UI, it's much more easy. In the Visual Studio Code, it is um, like half easy. Uh, uh, um, but in UI, you can see it very clearly, okay, that this is the line you, you have to change. Another one? Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers.